And you can see there, this is a story in the Wall Street Journal today. Rate probe expands to bank traders. The LIBOR probe, the LIBOR scandal is moving far, far beyond Barclays. It is not just one bank, not just one group of traders. This is taking on a global tone of how widespread this rate rigging was what happens now, how bad was it, and maybe even what happens next. That's what we're talking about here this morning on the Markets Hub. Good morning, everyone. I am Paul Vigna. I'm joined from London by Mr. David Enrich, who's been covering this story. Uh, David, you've been covering this story for years, actually. Give us yep. the latest today, because this is a very interesting story. Give us the latest on just how widespread this rate rigging was. Well, it was widespread to the extent that it was involved at least uh, more than a dozen traders at, it looks like about nine or 10 banks had individuals who were, they were kind of working in small bands of traders basically to uh, deliberately manipulate various types of LIBOR and other related indices. Uh, it also appears to involve um, individuals who worked at some brokers as opposed to banks as well. Uh, so it, it clearly, the scope of this, what we're, know, what we're learning about the scope of this continues to grow. Uh, it's happening on multiple different continents, uh, many different banks, many different rings of traders behaving very badly. And I think there's, we're going to see a lot more damaging revelations. Right. And, and let's talk for a second about what banks are involved. You say it's different banks, uh, banks in different countries, all big banks. You can see we're pulling up a screen, some of the names here. Citigroup, UBS, Deutsche Bank. I mean, these are all household names. HSBC, alleged, yep. alleged. Well, uh, and then you can see a couple of- The thing is, all, the, yeah, well only Good. the banks that comprise LIBOR are almost exclusively giant multinational right. banks. So, and that's, that's not a huge surprise, but it is, it's, it's striking in that there's so far all the spotlight has been on Barclays, the big British bank, which is understandable given that it's settled it lost basically its entire upper management team as yeah. a result of the scandal. But it's clear that there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, over the coming months on a lot of other banks, including big American ones like Citigroup, JP Morgan, and possibly Bank of America to explain how it was possible that these traders were I mean, basically cheating. Right, David, you have been covering this story for years now. You guys started talking about this back in 2008. If this was so widespread, if this was going on on such a big scale, and you started reporting on it so long ago, why has it taken so long for this to really get out? Uh, largely, I think because regulators and authorities on both sides of the Atlantic were basically asleep at the switch. There's an increasing evidence that uh, central banks and bank regulators in multiple different countries were well aware of this. I mean, as you said, the, the journal reported this on the front page multiple times in the spring of 2008. Here we are four years later and everyone is all of a sudden growing very outraged about this. Uh, but I, I mean, I think part of it is that until very recently, the consensus was that a number of banks had uh, basically cheated by understating their true borrowing costs, which you know seems bad and it is bad, but it's kind of understandable because banks want to appear as financially healthy as they are. So they say it costs them less to borrow than it really does. What's now becoming clear is that a huge strand of this and what was happening all over the world were that traders at these banks, separate and independent of what was happening in terms of lowballing LIBOR, traders at these a lot of these banks appear to have been conspiring with each other to rig LIBOR either up or down uh, in ways that would just directly benefit their own trading position. So right. that's a completely separate thing that anyone really understood at the time was going on. Exactly. It became a big issue when the banks were lowballing it because it was a question of their health. But that wasn't what started the scandal. That's what we're realizing now, obviously. That wasn't what started this LIBOR rate rigging, right? Yeah, no. There, this this yeah. bad behavior had been going on for several years, and starting around 2005, it looks like, which is you know two or three years before the first phase of the financial crisis really got underway. So. Clearly, this rate has been subject to a lot of abuse over the years, and what and you know every day we're learning about uh, different, increasingly creative ways that banks and their traders and outside brokers were trying to manipulate it. Right. Uh, David, I want to talk about uh, someone you mentioned in the story specifically, Tom Hayes. Explain who he is and what his role in was in role in this was. He well, his role started because he was a trader at UBS for several years uh, in the mid-2000s. He was working uh, on a desk that dealt with LIBOR. He started, it, from what we know from, uh, again, this is incomplete because we only know 
the limited amounts that have come out in court filings and what we've been able to pick up from sources. But our understanding is that he started uh, essentially a some sort of uh, rate rigging band while he was at UBS working with traders and live or submitters at other banks, as well as at brokers who work between banks. Uh, he then jumped from bank to bank. Uh, getting new jobs at other banks and basically replicated the practice, what he'd been doing at UBS, brought it elsewhere. So we're, the one theory that investigators are, appear to be looking at is the degree to which certain individuals, it's not just Tom Hayes, by the way, it's other right, bankers, right. Uh, other traders at other banks as well who've done the same thing, kind of started these bad practices at one bank. It worked really well for them there. They then got other jobs and uh, replicated the practices. And, and that's one way that this scandal appears to have spread around the world. Yeah, David, I, if... LIBOR has clearly been compromised. It is clearly a flawed instrument. Do you think that the that LIBOR is going to be drastically redesigned or maybe even totally scrapped? What, what's going to happen? What's going to be the upshot of this whole thing? Well, I don't know what the upshot is going to be. I think a lot of people are pondering that right now. But I do think, I think it's easier to answer the first question, which is will it be uh, either scrapped or dramatically altered? And mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is yes, it has to be. There's and it's very clear that in most major financial institutions and certainly most regulators uh, have lost faith in this. And when you start having politicians in Parliament or in Capitol Hill complaining about the lack of integrity to something as normally obscure as LIBOR, you know that there are going to need to be some real changes.